Hey folks, Seth Lake with VSL Aviation here today to talk to you about using weather on ForeFlight. Now, ForeFlight started as a weather product and it's kind of turned into an all-encompassing electronic flight bag, but it still really excels at giving you information on weather, but it can be a little overwhelming, especially if you're new to it. So I'm going to take you through, as quickly as possible, some of the basic functionalities of the weather products that are on there. Now you can use this if you're going to your check ride. Of course, I do a web series on, on taking your instrument check ride, your private pilot check ride. You're more than welcome to use it for that. But you can also use it for day-to-day -day flying. And I'm going to try to pass along the best techniques that I've picked up over the years that I've been using ForeFlight to fly. So first of all, uh, I kind of encourage people to use ForeFlight on the home screen is what I call it. It's just that basic maps page. That's what I have pulled up right now. Uh, so you can see right now, I don't have any weather layers selected. And you, you might notice that I have a lot more layers than probably you have with a base model. And that's not better or worse. It just means that you have the base model of ForeFlight, which doesn't have as much weather information as the Performance Plus or the Military Flight Pack version. And that's fine. Even the basic model is going to give you enough information. So I'm going to show you some features on here that you may not have. And that'll just kind of give you an idea and help you better understand of if it's if it's worth upgrading to that next level uh, or next subscription level of ForeFlight. So first of all, some house cleaning items. We're going to go to our settings page here. We're going to scroll all the way down, and I want you to make sure that your layer selector with multiple selections, it, that slider bar is turned to the right. What that's going to do is allow you to, to select multiple selections here without your layer selector disappearing. And that can be kind of frustrating when you're first learning the app. So we have that selected, and we're going to just start out by looking at a radar. So this is real basic function, looking at a radar over knee, overlaid on your moving map. Now, your layer selector is actually responsive to the type of data link that you have. That's really important to know because on the ground, you have access to all the stuff you would have access to if you're connected to a Wi-Fi connection or a cellular data connection. In the air, you're not going to have a cellular data or Wi-Fi connection, more than likely. So you're going to be connected to either ADS-B or Sirius XM. Now, both of those features are, the menu item is going to look a little bit different. You, you're going to have access to things that you might not have connected to a Wi-Fi network, and uh, or it's going to just look different. Uh, you might have a limited selection because you don't have as much information uh, over the data link of ADS-B as you do with Sirius XM, and you don't have as much as Sirius XM as you do with Wi-Fi. So we're kind of seeing as much as we can get on the Wi-Fi. So we're, we're really looking at this as a on-the-ground version. I'll try to do a video in the plane so you can see what that looks like connected to ADS-B and XM at a later time. But right now, your layer selector, this, these are the options that you have that you're able to select if you have a connection to Wi-Fi. So radar, we've got a composite option versus a lowest tilt. Now the difference between these is the lowest tilt is giving you that lowest beam of the radar, so kind of the ground return, the stuff that's hitting the ground or very close to the ground, versus the composite is kind of that composite layer cake of the of the storm or weather, and it's showing you all those layers. So it might show you the vertical development a little bit better than the lowest tilt option. The lowest tilt can look a little better than conditions actually are, so you can be a little optimistic if you're just using lowest tilt. So I would caution you on using that um, to, to make weather decisions, that is. Uh, next, we have uh, enhanced satellite and color satellite. These are going to help us determine the heights of clouds. I don't find myself using satellite information as much as radar information. Uh, but I'm sure there's other resources out there on how to interpret satellite information. On a whole, you can look and, and uh, you can see the color bar there at the bottom and also a sliding time bar that you can kind of snap through all the different satellite pictures over a given period of time. Big picture, the colder the clouds are, the higher altitude those clouds are at. So if you see a lot of really cold clouds... Uh, and it's surrounded by warm air, that that means those clouds might have a lot of a vertical development or they're, they're really high in altitude. We can kind of correlate that with our radar composite. We can see that over here right now by uh, Topeka, Kansas, we have some pretty big storms that are probably up there in altitude. And we can zoom in and actually see uh, that, yeah, we've got a, um, I'll try to circle it right here. We've got these numbers right here, which indicate 
the altitude, the tops of those clouds, which it looks like the nearest one is 39,000 uh, feet. So th those are some pretty tall clouds, and we can compare that with our enhanced satellite or our color satellite and see that right where we drew the circle around, that also happens to be um, a really cold cloud. So that means that it's got a lot of vertical development and it's up in that cold atmosphere. So that's kind of how we could use IR satellite to help us make some weather decisions. Uh, next, we have icing for US and icing global. Those are kind of the two options. And then we also have icing for 557 whiskey whiskey. Uh, so what those parentheses mean is that's where the icing data is coming from. So you have actually different sources of icing. You have icing US, global, and 557WW. Uh, I don't, I can't speak as to what exactly that means. It just means the sources might be National Weather Surface, Service, NOAA, versus some sort of European model uh, or European service on the 557. Not exactly sure, but... You know, if you wanted to get more information on that, ForeFlight does provide in your documents. You can go to ForeFlight and A1. We have the ForeFlight Mobile Pilots Guide, and you can just search uh, up here. We can just do five five seven. We'll just search that. That'll probably come up. Sure enough, here we are. We've got uh, our map legend, and then it it kind of categorizes U.S. Global, ADSB, Sirius XM, and five five seven WW. So those are the options of where that icing data could potentially come from. So just think of that as another data link. I wouldn't get too wrapped around the axle about that information. Not real important. It's just important on how you know how to use the icing functionality that's on here. So now that we have icing, we have a slide bar over to the right that we can select different altitudes. So let's say we're cruising at 9,000. We can zoom out here and we can see at 9,000 feet, we have a few places of icing around the country. Now, if we wanted to find out more about icing, it'd be really nice to see if there's any icing air mats. So we can also pull up that layer. So we're going to go to our layer selector and down here to air, sigmet, CWAs. And then we're going to come back on the bottom and we're going to select just the icing air mat. And you can see how those icing air mats kind of nicely overlay the areas that we have icing on the icing forecast at our 9,000 foot altitude. So that's kind of a way you can correlate icing information uh, that you're seeing from one product to another. Uh, so that's a little bit about icing. We're going to go down to turbulence. Turbulence is the same deal. We can pull up our turbulence. It's giving us an EDR. Now EDR, again, you can search. If you don't know what EDR means, you can go in here to the Four Flight uh, User Guide, EDR, and you can see that that's an eddy dissipation rate. It's really just a kind of fancy weather term to say how rough the air is on a scale of 10% to 90%. And it's nice and color-coded for us. So the lighter the color, uh, the lighter the turbulence. As it goes towards red, the heavier the turbulence. And we already have our uh, air met overlay pulled up, so we're going to turn off icing, and we're going to turn on our low turbulence air mets because we don't care about the stuff above 18,000 of private pilots or commercial pilots or piston pilots, basically. We're just really worried about the turbulence down low. So our low turbulence and at our cruising altitude of 9,000 feet, again, you can see how that's pretty tightly correlated with the areas of a turbulence air met and our turbulence uh, EDR of being from 20 to 30%. It's right around there. So we can say, hey, we're going to have some moderate chop or, or maybe uh, light to moderate turbulence in those areas. So that's our turbulence. The next is clouds. Clouds, is this is one of my favorite forecasts. Uh, it's showing you the literal, you know, where the clouds are in your path. So again, we're going to say we're we're cruising around eight to 10,000 feet. Uh, so we have our slide bar set to 8,000 feet. And we can see that we have clouds over, you know, a lot of the north of the United States. And we can check down lower, let's say as we descend, are we going to run into any clouds? Still looks like it's pretty clear, might be some more clouds around us here in Arkansas. Uh, on down to 3,000 feet, you can see it takes a while to load um, each layer depending on um, the type of data link that you have, uh, but it's giving you that altitude by altitude. Now, let's say we really want to look at kind of a cross section of our flight path of are we going to run into any clouds on this flight or turbulence? So we're just going to type in a quick route of flight from Russellville to, let's say, uh, sure, Scott Air Force Base, Mid-America. We're going to add that to our route. 
So this is now our route of flight, and our departure time is going to be now. And instead of going to any weather stuff, we're going to go to our profile page, and we're going to pull up, uh, we're going to turn off air spacing, icing, and turbulence, and we're just going to look at clouds. So you can see that traveling at 6,000 feet, we don't run into any clouds, but if we increase our altitude up to 15,500 feet, we can see that we, we start to run into some clouds around 15,000 feet. So that's our cloud overlay. We can look at our turbulence overlay and see that we kind of have some light turbulence, light to moderate turbulence as we depart, but then it should be pretty smooth the rest of our route until we start descending into Scott Air Force Base, and then we're going to run into some light turbulence again. We can also do that with icing and see that there's a little bit of icing just uh, beyond our top of descent into Scott, right around the 15,500 foot. So if I were to see this actually, and I was in an airplane that didn't have uh, flight into known icing capability, I might take to take the uh, the altitude slider bar, and I might move it down to 11,500, uh, and that keeps me, you know, a couple thousand feet below that predicted icing layer over there. Um, so that's some ways I can use the map and interactions to see both the the vertical and horizontal kind of profile of how my weather is interacting with a given route of flight. It's a really useful thing that Forth Light gives us there. Uh, all right, next is our surface analysis. So we're going to turn off our aeronautical overlay here and our SIGMETs, and we're going to zoom out because our surface analysis is just giving us basically a prog chart overlaid onto our moving map display, and we can correlate our route of flight with that. So we can see that as we fly to Scott, we're flying into the back of a warm front. Well, remember what we were saying before is warm fronts can kind of be that wet blanket of, of pulling stratiform clouds over. So what I would predict of just looking at this, um, at this warm front movement here and a cold front coming in behind it, that I might have some areas of lower visibility behind that frontal line. So I might want to look at my ceilings in that area. Well, ForeFlight also allows us to do that pretty quickly with the layer selector. We're going to tap on surface analysis uh, or our overlay selector, and we're going to scroll down to uh, our ceiling option here. So we've got our ceiling option selected, and we can see that we're still VFR there at Scott, uh, but we do have a scattered layer at 4,400. Uh, and you can see the other layers around that. Now it's all labeled green, so that means that it's VFR, but we do have reported ceilings less than 12,000 feet. So there is a ceiling present there. It's just not a very low ceiling, and it still qualifies as VFR. We can zoom out. We can probably find somewhere else. Yeah, sure. Over here, Nebraska, we have some areas of IFR. Colorado has some areas of low IFR. Uh, and that's kind of neat to pull this up, and you can see how it correlates with those frontal movements. Uh, but that warm front kind of proved me wrong. You know, the, the warm front I would expect to have lower visibility than that. That just might mean that it's a pretty weak warm front and it doesn't have a lot of moisture that it's carrying behind it. Um, and we're not too worried about it. Uh, so that's kind of how I could use those two um, layer analysis options to look at my route of flight. Uh, we can ignore the uh, the Civil Air Patrol grids and the G cars or uh, GRS grids. Uh, and we, the TFR is the, the temporary flight restriction. That's a useful layer to have up. Uh, you can zoom out and see um, down here on the, the border, we've got some TFRs. If we just tap on those, it'll pull up the TFR text and tell us what it's for. Uh, we are approaching fire season here. Um, you could have presidential TFRs or VIP TFRs. Uh, sports arenas sometimes will have TFRs. We can see there's a TFR over here. That's probably for some sort of SpaceX launch over by Cape Canaveral. So the TFR layer is nice. The GAFOR layer uh, is not useful unless you're in Europe. So if you're over in Europe, we can pull uh, that layer off. I haven't actually looked to see what that'll pull up, but I'm not real familiar with what it does. The reason I know what it is is, again, we can go to our four flight. We can hit search, and we can just type in GAFOR. And you can see that uh, the GAFOR is Europe only, and it's the General Aviation Forecast Layer. So we're not really worried about that here in the States. So some other layers to talk about. We've got our flight category. I really like this one. Uh, it kind of reminds me of those uh, METAR maps. I've got a couple of those in the flight school here. And it's in the normal symbology of green, blue, red, and pink, depending on if it's VFR, marginal VFR, IFR, or low IFR. You can find that, again, with the 4Flight Mobile Pilot's Guide. 
Uh, actually, I don't think it's in the mobile pilot's guide. I think we can find that in the mobile legends. Let's look at that. So if we go to mobile legends and we scroll down here, yeah, towards the back, we've got our low IFR, IFR, marginal VFR, VFR, and unknown. And this is really nice because that actually spells out the definitions of those as far as 3,000 feet, 5 miles for VFR, 1,000 to 3 to 5 for marginal VFR. I won't go through all those. But if you have kind of a, a, a brain fart and you can't remember what those are, the four flight weather legends spells those out exactly what those dots mean. Um, I like using this uh, for, for kind of a quick glance of what does the weather look like in my region. Uh, but I also really like using the ceiling because not only does it give me the same coloration as far as green, red, blue, or, or pink, but it also gives me a number for that ceiling because sometimes it could be VFR right at 4,000 feet. And we know that there's some terrain in that area and really we would like to be higher than that. Um, so it might be below our personal mems. So, so this actually gives me some situational awareness on where the ceilings actually are, not just that they're VFR, because VFR could be 3,000 feet or it could be 12,000 feet, and that's not the same uh, decision-making criteria for everybody else. The next thing I'll bring up that is a really cool feature is the wind speeds. Now, the wind speeds, first of all, it's a very beautiful chart. It looks really cool. There was an old app called Windy that kind of gave us similar information. But right now, we're, we're looking at the 8,000-foot winds. And what I really like about this is it can help you kind of understand weather a little bit better, I think, because you're looking at these this big kind of wind pattern. And what we can do is we can search around on this chart, and we can find areas where the wind is acting a little weird, where we're seeing some sort of cyclonic or anti-cyclonic behavior and if you're learning winds you can say well i predict that right here around omaha i'm seeing a really strong counterclockwise motion so so what kind of weather system would that be associated with well i can go back to my surface analysis and i can see that i have a low pressure system sitting there over omaha causing that counterclockwise rotation. I can go back to my wind speeds and sure enough I got the counterclockwise rotation. So I can go back up here over uh, you know between Vancouver and Alaska and I see this really strong system where I'm seeing a lot of counterclockwise rotation. I can go back here to my surface analysis and we can see that there again we have some really low isobars uh, and a low pressure system with an occluded front moving in it. And we can see how that frontal system and that low pressure system is associated with our wind movements. And that can that feature, I think, can help you understand air masses a little bit better. And if you feel you're struggling a little bit with this, I would suggest going to your document section, your FAA, your handbooks, and Aviation Weather AC006 Bravo. I've got that pulled up right now as far as our surface wind versus low pressure, high pressure, and our, our surface wind flows. This is a great book, and it's hyperlinked in here. So you have contents right here, chapter 1 through 23, that you can go through and brush up on your weather. So this is a really good product to understand weather at a fundamental level. So back to our map page, we've gone through basically all the layers. Uh, one thing that isn't weather related, but it is, I think, important to bring up, and that's our hazard uh, advisor. This is another feature that you'll have on a layer selector, and it just allows us to decide on, depending on what altitude we fly at, are we going to get close to terrain? So you can see that if we were to plan a flight from us up to St. Louis, uh, right here at uh, 1,700 feet out, that's really low altitude, we basically wouldn't be able to do that. We can look at our profile and see that we're going to start running into a mountain, uh, and we can hold our finger up here. We can see about 16 miles after departure, we're going to start running into terrain. And uh, if we wanted to clear that terrain, we really need to fly at a minimum, looks like, of about 2,500 feet. And that's going to give us uh, a clearance of 796 uh, or 769. Really, that's not quite enough. So we want to clear stuff by, you know, at least a thousand feet. So we can we could play with those altitudes until we get an appropriate level of clearance. But that's just a neat thing, a neat feature. Again, not weather related, but it, it is the layer related. Uh, so we also have lightning and pyreps. So you can use this in conjunction with our radar and zoom out here. 
and you can see that, okay, we've got a lot of pyreps of turbulence, and we have a lot of lightning strikes along this, this storm here. That's showing me that the storm has a lot of energy versus I see a radar return that doesn't have a lot of lightning strikes. That might say, well, you know, maybe, if I, especially if I onboard uh, weather radar, not just onboard data link or next red radar, but the, but onboard uh, active radar, then I might be able to penetrate an area of, of green that I'm seeing on the radar if I don't see these lightning strikes. But right now, let's say if I'm trying to transit between, uh, you know, from east to west over Kansas right now, there's really no valid holes, quote unquote, for me to get through this line of storms. I'm going to have to deviate around it or land and wait for it to pass. Uh, I can also pull up my air mats and sig mats and see that my turbulence air mats are, are pretty tightly correlated around those air mats of uh, turbulence, and my icing air mats are kind of around those areas of, of uh, pyrept icing. I do have, you know, this is interesting, I've got some areas of icing right here. These are pyreps um, that are outside an icing air mat. Um, so that might lead, if, if center keeps seeing that, they might... Center might issue a center weather advisory, CWA, because they're seeing, well, hey, there's not an air met for icing, but we've gotten five pyreps for icing, so we're going to make a center weather advisory, and we're going to say that the icing exists in that location. So that's just a little, uh, little bit of extra information on how that could work. Okay, so now we've got, uh, we've used our map page kind of, I think, to a good extent, and we've explored that. We want to get an official weather briefing from Four Flight, and we're able to do that. So we're again, we're just going to leave our Russellville to Scott Air Force Base and the Travel Air departing uh, right now, and we're going to send this to flights. Now, when we send this over to flights, we're going to want to immediately put in our alternate. Um, Four Flight does have an alternate advisor. Uh, so if you just tap in the alternate there, it's going to start retrieving your alternates. And what it's doing is just looking at the general area around your destination airport. And it's going to find you something that, that Four Flight thinks it's suitable. And it's going to give you some refer information. So we've got Sparta Community, Hunter Field. Uh, it gives us our basic weather information. It's non-towered. It gives us our longest runway. Um, so that's good to know. Now, uh, SPI, Abraham Lincoln Capital, it's 30 three minutes away, so it's a little bit longer. It's going to take us 12 gallons. There is wind shear uh, reported there, and it has an ILS and localizer, uh, so maybe not the best. And then we've got St. Louis Lambert International. It's 12 minutes, four gallons of fuel, has a really long runway, ILS and localizer. I really like that one, so I'm going to add that as my alternate. Then I'm going to tap the briefing button. So Four Flight's going to go out there and it's going to retrieve my brief, and it's going to display it in one of three ways. Right now, I've got it show, showing a PDF uh, briefing. So this is probably a six or seven page PDF briefing that has my weather notams and, and some of the weather charts on there. Uh, not very interactive, but it's great if you want to print it out and put it in a check ride folder or print it out, put it on your knee board and have as a backup just in case your iPad dies. If you want to change how this uh, weather briefing looks, you can hit your more button, you can go to your global settings, and scroll almost all the way to the bottom, and you've got three options here. Your graphical HTML briefing, your graphical PDF, or your, gra or your classic text. So a lot of people prefer, and the default setting for ForeFlight is the graphical HTML. So we're going to select that one, go back, we're going to hit briefing again, and refresh. And now this is going to pull up a different kind of briefing. I kind of call it a threat forward briefing. It's going to tell us about our hazardous um, hazardous things first. So our adverse conditions come first, and we do have a closed or unsafe notum. So we would want to know about that first. We've got a convective sigmet. That's hazardous. We've got, looks like an icing, a low and high turbulence, and low level wind shear. Those are air mets. Uh, and then we've got one urgent pie rep here. Uh, so we can we can look at this right here, and it gives us our aircraft type. It's a DC-12, low-level wind shear, plus or minus 10 knots, uh, uh, runway 26 left. And it looks like that came out of some one of the fields around uh, St. Louis. So that's actually an urgent pyre up there. So that's something that we'd want to take into account. And then it goes on to give us our, our current weather, our forecast weather, and our notams. And notice it gives us our notams for... Our departure, uh, our notams for our destination, and our notams for our alternate. That's really important. That's why we added our alternate into the flight section before we generated 
the briefing. Um, now, if you're preparing for a, a check ride, what I would recommend is go ahead and print out that PDF briefing, and that has everything on paper. You can put it in a binder, have it nice and organized, and then in addition to that, pull up the HTML briefing so you can interact with that on your foreflight. Because most of the time, uh, on your day-to-day -day flying, that's how you're probably going to interact with your your briefing. Uh, now, some quick things about foreflight weather as a whole. There there may be a question on is it uh, approved and and the answer is there is no such thing as an approved source of weather if you're doing a self briefing uh, now where i get that guidance i've done another video on it i think it was in one of my ifr acs uh, things that i did there but if if you look at the instrument acs there in section one i've got the uh the advisory circular 9192 the very last page yeah appendix b this is your pre-flight checklist Notice this checklist and look at the similarities between this and what ForeFlight's telling you. So this is asking for your weather advisories, your SIGMETs, AIRMETs, convective SIGMETs, CWAs, your synopsis, your en route and destination forecast, NOTAMs. Okay, we've got all of that. Our adverse conditions, synopsis, current weather, uh, en route, destination, alternate forecast, or winds aloft, NOTAMs, TFRs, PIREPs, uh, any uh, special use airspace. Of course, that's going to show up as our TFRs. Um, and our non-weather related stuff, we've got our personal minimum fuel, uh, fuel requirements, airport alternates, traffic delays, uh, takeoff and landing distance, and uh, RAIM information. So ForeFlight is able to give us all of this information, right? We can go to ForeFlight, our nav log, we pull up our nav log, it even has uh, our RAIM with a 5% mask with barrow aiding. Um, so it's giving us RAIM information, it's giving us TFRs, it's giving us runway length, and we can either print it out, which I would suggest printing out both the nav log and the flight briefing, uh, just to cover your bases and to have a good backup. It's not a bad idea because iPads do overheat occasionally. Um, they you drop and break them, uh, the battery dies, whatever. So having a, a paper backup is valid. And I think for flight meets the intent of that advisory circular. Uh, and there's no reason that, to think that this is an illegal briefing. You can use this as your sole source of weather. Now, would I suggest going out there and, and getting weather from other resources? Well, sure. Um, that's good. Um, you know, go to the National Weather Service. But uh, ForeFlight also gives you access to some of that as well. One of the things we haven't talked about is your image tab on ForeFlight. That's where you can find all the stuff we've been talking about uh, and more uh, is is here on the imagery tab. So the imagery tab of ForeFlight goes through, uh, it has some featured weather products, it has prog charts uh, for all the way out to seven day, it has your Conus cloud, it has icing forecast, icing severity analysis, uh, radar, pyreps, it has everything here and you can kind of just go through a la carte style and choose the type of weather forecast or products that you want. And all of the, the charts that you find on here, you're going to be able to find on um, aviationweather.gov. Uh, but if there's other places that you want to go, uh, some place that I would recommend is Weathersport. Uh, Weathersport is uh, a really neat place. Oh, my subscription expired, but uh, that's a little weird. That The su subscription just expired to that, but so I'll have to renew that. But it gives you uh, some different style of, of weather information, uh, and it's an, an additional $70 a month. Do I think you really need that? Maybe. If, if you really geek out on weather, if you fly IFR a lot, I think the more information that you can get, the better. Uh, but for now, I think ForeFlight, uh, as a basic instrument pilot, is giving you more than enough data to go out and safely fly. So anyway, thanks for watching, and I hope you found it useful. See you next time.